So Ibn al-Jawzi Allah's inclusion mm-hmm. among the Ash'ariyah is not established, mm-hmm. first of all, by the Tabaqat literature. Because there is, uh, ne- uh, Najmuddin al-Tufi is, was an Ash'ari in his early career, but he was also a 12 or Shiite in his theology, mm-hmm. a Mu'tazili. So listen, if someone was an Ash'ari, we'll list it. But out of all the Tabaqat literature, he's never been listed as one. All right. There's only one other one, uh, Muhammad ibn Muhammad Asadi. He was who wrote the Al Jawhar al Muhassal. He was Ashari. He was Ashari. We will list when they are. He died sure. nine nine hundred Hijri. Mm-hmm. We will list when people are that mm-hmm. because it's such a strange and unusual thing. Yes, it's like uh, it's it's like seeing a giraffe with uh, stripes. Mm-hmm. We will mention it. If somebody had some things about them that were unusual, we'll mention them. Like Ibn Aqil. We will mention Ibn Aqil. He, his family were Mu'tazili Hanafis, and then they all became Hanabila. And then we'll list this. It will be listed. What happened to them and how it happened. That's one thing because we were the only ones writing the history because there was no one else. Mm-hmm. They didn't exist yet. They were all Ahlul Bida at the time of writing this history. That, that has to be understood. At the time we're writing the history, whether it's uh, uh, Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari, there are no Ash'aris. They don't mm-hmm. exist. Yes. So up until the 440s, there was no other theology. It didn't exist. The first, ma- the first Ash'aris arrive in North Africa, missionaries, arrive in the 500s. Well, what were the Manichees before them? We, we have the historical data. Someone challenges me, challenges me on it. I can, I can get them the historical proof of the Ashadis first appearing in North Africa at that date. Mm-hmm. Shafi's, we know how, because of obviously Abu Hassan Ashadi, he was Hanafi Mu'tazila, then he became Shafi by studying with Abu Saqqa al Fariani. That's, he, was, he was started off being Hanafi, then he became Shafi. Mm-hmm. Because, the, because the Mu'tazila were Hanafis primarily. That's what happened. These are historical realities. Hanafis, well, Hanafis are discussed in, in the East, mm-hmm. Ahl Sunnah, but here in the Muslim West, they're Ahl Bidah. This is the reality. Subhanallah. Carried on up until Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani's time because he, he denounced them as well. These are facts. He, these are things that can't be denied. They're realities. This, again, Akhi, we're talking about history. Yes. We're not talking about argument, arguments and denigrating people. We're just talking history mm-hmm. so imam al-jawzi rahimahullah his theological background was the issue with him was the sifat al-khabariya he didn't have any issues the sifat al the sifat al-af'al or sifat al fi'liya there's no issues with this it was these other things and even then he still affirmed uh, al-mu'tamad yes he still he still affirmed it so even with this quirk Mm-hmm. which was a quirk that he had. Right. Where he's, okay, I don't do ifbat and I don't do nefi because I'm trying to avoid tashbiyah. That's not what the Ashari teach. <laughs> mm-hmm. They don't, they don't, I don't do ifbat and I don't do nefi. No one's ever said that before, except for him. Mm-hmm. Yes. But then, but then on the back of that, you have him affirming i'tiqad al-qadri, which is a mukhtasar of al-mu'tamid, which is a mukhtasar of talat al mm-hmm. So if he's an Ashari, what's he doing affirming these kutub? And also the other statements against uh, Ta'wil and, and Kalam, right? Yes. So how, how do you deal with these? Right. Because, because he, he, he seems to think that Ta'wil is a wellspring that takes people towards, uh, <laughs> excuse me, towards Ta'atil, mm. which is the doorway to atheism. He, because because his, his, his reasoning for that in Sayyid al-Khatir is that people b- affirming the Sifat but being mistaken can be forgiven for that because of dubious matters in their own mind. That's a, that, that's a shubha that's in his mind. It's not the ayah, which is another thing. Ibn al-Jazirah Allah never, never taught that someone could read the ayat and that the ayat could make them fall into major, which is, which is something that some of the Ashadi do teach that, oh, if you read this ayah as it is, it, it could make you fall into tashbih and tashbih. Mm-hmm. No. Revelation never leads people astray. He said the shubha is in their mind. Allah. But to do tetwil, 
you have to consciously do Tatil first. Mm -hmm. That's that's his statement. It's not mine. He says you have to consciously do Tatil, which it has to go in that direction because you have to deny the wujud of something, do Tatil, because you have to, first of all, affirm the meaning of something because Tatil is moving something from one meaning to another meaning. Mm -hmm. That's what Tatil means. So you have to know what it means to move it to another meaning. But you have to start, but but what that means, you know, Joseph, his understanding is there's ta'atil, it starts off, so you start off purposely denying. The man that commits a mistake in understanding because he 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 comes to a false understanding, of a severe, that's a shubha in his own mind. Mm -hmm. And he can be forgiven that because of because of the impediments of takfir. Mm -hmm. He can be forgiven, he can be forgiven that. Mm -hmm. How do we know that? The woman in the time of the Sahaba who said, I love Allah so much. If I could, I'd take him and wrap him in swaddling clothes and feed him from my own breast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that's is that Tashbi? Isn't it? Yeah. If, if you right. Would. Yeah. And some of the Sahaba got angry, but the other one said, no, 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 leave it. That's the only words that she right. has. She doesn't mean that. Exactly. But anytime somebody denied an ayah, they got killed. So <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> any, anytime yeah. somebody denied an ayah, mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't think that they got killed. Right. Or the man who said, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn as when he asked Omar, what does this ayah mean? And Omar said, take off your, take off your amam. And he saw that his head wasn't bald. He said, I thought you were Khawaj, I was going to kill you. <laughs> Why? Because he, because he's trying to go into the meaning of these ayahs. Hmm, interesting. 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 So if you deny ayat, you get killed. If you ask the meaning of ayat where we know we don't know what they mean, you get killed. What's that saying? But then you have a woman who says some things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about the man who said by accident, the farih, who said, oh Allah, I'm your Lord and you're my slave. And he said it by accident. He said, farih Allah be, and Allah was happy with him. Because mm -hmm. he knew what was in him. That's not what he meant when he said on his tongue. Yes. See, that's what I mean. Unintentional, basically. That's what I mean. The shubha is in his mind. There's mm -hmm. no shubha in the Quran or the book or the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. That's pure revelation. That's pure revelation from Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, amma yushrikun, glorified and exalted is Allah from anything they associate. There's nothing in the revelation that's dubious. The shubha is in us. Recall the words of Mu'af al Qudama. And whatever is ambiguous to us from that is compulsory to establish its wording. And to leave seeking its meaning. We return knowledge of the meaning of it to the one who said it. And the responsibility for knowing it to the one that narrated it. Subhanallah. MashaAllah. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. That's the first page. That's like paragraph four of the my first page. Because <laughs> yes. it was beat. That's the this stuff was beaten into us. <laughs> that stuff was beaten into us when we were when we were young. It's like, you better learn, you better learn this. So we had to learn the the the, the actual paragraph markers. Oh, There's Allah. 86. There's 86 of the paragraph markers. There's eight fusul and 86 paragraph markers. Because we were made to learn that stuff. Mashallah. So this is how important this stuff is. That the wisdom of this can't be denied. Mm -hmm. So if there's any shubha, oh, well, people might read it and think this. Well, the shubha is in their mind. It's not the ayah. No one, no one can read Revelation and go astray unless the shubha is in them. There's nothing in the Quran that's going to make somebody go, huh? Something in the book and Sunnah. Now, true enough, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, he did say, um, the, the hadith are like a snake in a wood pile for the one that comes to them. Yes, for the one that comes to them without knowledge. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that about the muhadithun or anybody. Yes. He said, for the one that comes to them without it. That's why, that's why the Rasulullah warned people about trying to follow the mutashabi 
And one of the signs of the Khawaj is following the Mutashabi. Why? Because we don't know it. And there's two Mutashabi. There's the Mutashabi in description, if you wasf, and Mutashabi if you hukum. Mutashabi in wasf, we're not going to get that. We're not going to know that. Mutashabi if you hukum is because we misunderstand the hukum because we have to put all the ayat together on the topic to get the full sense. Right. Which is what happened to the Khawarij with Ali because they didn't put all the, they had in al-hukum illa lillah, surat al-kahf, they had the 18th surah I-26. Wait a minute, hold on, but you have to put that with the other one, the other ayat about coming together for shura and things like that. Mm-hmm. So they were they were mistaken, not just in the mutashabih, in wasf, in the hukum as well. Allah. And that's what we take away from that. So it's like Imam Joseph, his entire scholarly legacy like his theological scholarly has been distorted in english mm-hmm. yes absolutely the english has been distorted i've never met anybody in arabic that's read his books and concluded that he was that he was from the i've never seen that mm-hmm. there's only one quote i've seen where somebody said that but the the one who said that as Zahabi sent him a letter to rebuke him because he said that he was saying false things about the scholars and other things. And that's why when Imam Al-Zahabi cites him in his Seer A'lam and nubala he doesn't give him the full statement as being fiqa hmm. because, because, because he intentionally said that stuff that he knew wasn't true. So he doesn't get the full hukum as fiqa. You don't get it. So he's suduq. He's suduq. I believe also one of the reasons why people today, especially in the West, call Imam al Jawzi a Nashari is because they have this notion that he's one of those few sound Hanbali scholars whom they call the Fudula ul Hanabila. But this is like a false statement. Yes, the, the problem with it is when you use the word Fudala, which was used by this individual whom Imam al Zahabi uh, categorically okay. rebuked. When you use this expression, fudala, you see you have fadil, which is one, mm-hmm. fadilan, which is two. Fudala is three and more. Mm-hmm. Right. So when somebody says fudala are like this, we have to ask the question. Okay, you've given us one, but we've shown that that is not the case. Give us three more. Mm-hmm. Because fudala means three and more. I'll be generous with the Arabic and say, just give me three. Mm-hmm. You've already cited Ibn Jose and Michelle. That's not true. Even if we grant him, that's one. Now you owe me two more. Bring me two more scholars. In fact, I'll even be more generous. Bring me two that have the same theology as Ibn Jose and Akhbar al-Sifat. I want to see that. <laughs> I want to see mm-hmm. two more Hanbali scholars who have his same theology on not doing if bad or nephi in the in, in the in the sifat al khabariya I want to see that. Mm-hmm. This should be interesting. Well, you don't know, brother. Maybe they could bring them. What are you saying that you've read all the books of Hamid theology? I'd say <laughs> three fourths. I'd, I'd say three fourths. Mm-hmm. I say three fourths. Sure. That's not a brag. I'm saying this for a reason. Mm-hmm. So if pressed, I'd say three-fourths. Because there are some things in manuscripts I've not been able to get to. Mm-hmm. But because of what we know through the tabakat literature or anything else, I'm not worried about that either. I'm not worried about that either. And we know that other people didn't share the Ithbat and Nefi concept of Ibn Jozi because of what was mentioned in historical accounts by Muafuddin Qudama, Abdul Ghanim Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi, Ibn al Imad, and Abu Umar al Maqdisi, who were all people who were there around that same time, as well as Ibn Idrus, these were all people that were there. And then we have people who lived after that time who were in, in alliance with Imam al Jazi regarding his tafsir and hadith classes. And they lived after, such as Imam Yahya al Sarsari, who died 656 Hijri. I have his Medah, because he, he, he only writes in Medah. He only oh, writes sure. in poetry. All of his books, like his fiqh books are in poetry, his creed books are in poetry, oh, his sure. zuhud books are in poetry, his uh, Sira books, they're all in Medah. Oh. 
he says the exact same theology. And he was in Baghdad after that time up to the end. Nothing. We have, Ab- we have Abdullah bin Sufyan al-Qadumi, rahimahullah, who cites Ibn Jawzi regularly as, as a hujjah uh, for proofs in the school. No. No issue of bad nif. Then we have, so we have the era after Ibn Jawzi immediately. Then we have the era after that, which is the 700s. The 700s, you're coming to the era of Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. And we know that's not true because we have his taqrir, we have his, we have his fadlu ilm al-salaf the virtue of the ilm of salaf over the khalif. Mm-hmm. What's that telling you? We have a countless, he wrote a book called Kitab al which we know is nothing like the Ithbat and nephew of what mm-hmm. Ibn Jozi has. Mm-hmm. I have that book, Kitab al Then we have, obviously we have Ibn Qayyim, who died 751 Hijri. We have Taqid ibn Taymiyyah, who lived 661 to 72a. So that's not true. His son, his, his brother, Abdullah ibn Taymiyyah, no. That's not true. Then we have after uh, Ibn al-Liham, who dies 803. We have uh, Shams al-Din al-Muflih, who dies 763. That's not the case. Then we get to the era of Musa ibn Ahmad al-Hajjawi and Taqid ibn Fatuhi. We know they didn't. Mm-hmm. Then we get after them to the era of Al-Karmi, as well as Al-Bahuti, 10, 1033 and 1051 Hijri, respectively. We know they didn't. Mm-hmm. Then we get to the era after them, which is Ibn Qa'ib Najdi, who dies uh, 1097, Hijri, rahimahullah. Then we also have Ibn Balbani, who dies 1083. We know that they didn't, because Balbani's got like two, three creed books. And Mukhtasir. We know he did. Uh, Al-Mawahibi, Ibn Abdul Baqi, he dies 10, 10, 10, 15. We know that he didn't. Then we get to the era of people like Sheikh Salman Abdul Wahab. We know that he didn't because we have his literature from his father and his grandfather regarding the curriculum that he studied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we definitely know that he did. That's wrong. Because, because he said in the fifth chapter into the Divine Lightning that he agrees with the majority of what Ibn Qayyim and uh, Taqid ibn Taymiyyah said mm-hmm. on the topic of visiting the graves and things like that. He said the majority, but there's other stuff that he didn't agree with. And we have the kutub to establish that from uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Muhammad and Muhammad Abdul Aziz, his sons and grandsons, mm. who handed down the manuscripts of books such as uh, Al Munadhara fil Quran, Al Sarkhad fil Quran, Zamut Tawil. They're one of the main families that have handed down to us Zamut Tawil, the blameworthiness of Tawil by Muaf al Qudama as well as the Luma. They're one of the they're one of the Asanid. So we know that they didn't have the theology. Then we carry on. And we get to the era of Hassan al-Shatti, who he's got the Sharh and the Mukhtasar on the Lawamiya by Imam al-Safarini, 1189 and 1274 respectively. Ruhay Bani. Ruhay Bani, we know that he did mm-hmm. because he dies 1243 and he's friends with uh, Imam Hassan al-Shatti. Then we get down the line to them where we get to Imam al lubidi who dies 1319. We know his theology because he states it at the beginning. He's in a fiqh book, but he's talking about creed at the very beginning. Then we have Abdullah Sufyan al-Qadumi dies 1331. Musa al-Qadumi, who's his, who's, his, uh, who's his cousin brother, we know their, their theology. And the Shatis that are in uh, Baghdad as well as in, as well as in Damascus, we know their theology. Then we have Ismail ibn Badran, Abdul Rahman al-Shami, uh, as, as well as... Uh, <coughs> as well as Salih Hashemi, we know their theology. Mm-hmm. Because, because when they were asked by Mustafa Hamdur Alayyan to affirm, we've already got the Ida'at and other kutub from Mubarak al-Haslan. We know their theology. And it's not their wheel. We know that it's not. Abdul Basid al ruhaybani we know that that's not his theology. <laughs> Ahmed al-Shami, we know that's not his theology. Muwafiq Uyun, even like he's, he's a current Mufi or Fakita, we know his theology. We know from Mustafa Hamdur Ali, we know it's not his. Mashallah. The most recent Shakti, Muhammad Isam al-Din al-Shakti, we know that he right. didn't have that theology. Mm-hmm. It's like we know these things because Muhammad Isam al-Shakti helped put together what's called Ulum, Ulum al-Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, which is literally Imam Ahmed, all of the Ulum collected from all the books of his Ashab put in one place. Subhanallah. And that was done by a whole bunch of Hanabila in Egypt and Asyud, not far from our home village. It was put together by all these men. And he oversaw that project. Nothing. The big Imam Muhammad said, we know he didn't do table because I have his sharh on the Lumat al Itiqad, which is uh, 18 classes. We know that he didn't. 
We know that he, then we have Abdul Malik ibn Dahesh who died like what, 1414 Hijri? We know he didn't. We know he didn't. Then we have uh, Abdullah Muhammad al Khulayfi, who we've got his book, uh, uh, Zayr uh, al-Mubtadi'een. We know he didn't. Mm -hmm. So who are we talking about? I've just, I don't know how many Muradi' or Hanabit I've rattled off. Yes. But we're trying to ask, I just want three <laughs> or just two that had Ibn Josie's same thing about is bad to Nefi. I just, I need this. I need like two more. No. Because that would satisfy the statement for the last three or more. Mm, okay. Because, because, because at, the, at the time <laughs> that that statement was made was in the era of Taqiyyad bin Yes. Exactly. So, where, so where, were the, where were the three in his time? Mm -hmm. Who would they be in his time? Abu Hamza al Maqdisi? No, we have his creed. He, he did like a summary of, uh, of, of Ibtal al Tawila. He did like a really small mukhtasar on it. So we know he's not. Oh, well, what about Rasani? What, the, sa the same Rasani who did a mukhtasar on Al-Aqidat al wasitiyah You sure you want to use him? <laughs> because the section on Akhbar al-Sifat is not complimentary. It's kind of in line with everybody else. Mm -hmm. He's like, even, even small mukhtasarat is, is not there. Ibn al-Hanbali, no, because he wrote the book Al-Rad al shairah so he's definitely, he's definitely, he's definitely not. He died six. He died like six, seven, six or something. He, he's definitely not the one. Ibn Hamdan, no. Ibn Hamdan, his Nihaya to Mubtadiin, that book, his mm -hmm. Nihaya, that's actually a Sharh on the Luma. And he died six nine five. So it can't be that. Mm -hmm. Sefarini, we know his theology. Nope, it's not him. Ibn in fact, yeah, Ibn Qaid al Najdi, we know because he wrote mm -hmm. Najat al Khalifi fi i'tiqad al Salaf. We know it's not him. And he has another one, he has a hashi on the Muntaha where he goes into Creed again under Kitab Hukum mm Murtad. -hmm. Yeah. So it's not that. So then, what exactly are we talking about? Because if we look at from the 700s of the 8th century Hijri, we don't find these three Fudala mm -hmm. or two more. We don't find them in Ibn Josie's time. And we don't find them through the catalog of ages. Where are these? Where are they? These full the land. Yes, that's the, that is the whole case. Where are they? Because that's all mm -hmm. I'm asking. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying anything else but that. Mm -hmm. I just need to know. The interesting thing is that this this whole title Fudala, it is still around mm. and still used by some mm. but the whole problem which comes down is that the meaning behind this whole statement is that besides these Fudala, everyone's deviant mm. or, or majority yeah. that's what it comes down to but yeah. from what we understand is that this term came to be during the time of Taqiyud ibn Taymiyyah Yes. Due to this cause having debates with him, disagreeing with him, and then yes. concluding, making this erroneous conclusion of Fodola. Yes, because because this is a this is a problem. And what people forget is they'll often say, So are you saying the scholar that made this case? I mean, yes. he was a big he was a big yes. scholar in his time. Oh, are we talking about the same scholar who said there's no way that uh the sun can be bigger than the earth? Uh -huh. because uh because eclipses happen by the will of allah but it's no way that it could be because of the shadow of the sun because it's clear to all that the sun is obviously smaller than the earth are we talking about that same scholar hmm. or the one who denied lunar eclipses because he said there's no way that the shadow of the earth could be passed in front and, and the shadow could be blocking them because Strong. it's clear that the moon is smaller than the earth Okay. Well, what's your proof? Well, just look at him. <laughs> what type of proof is that? We, so we're talking about the same one. The same one who one of the heads of Jarh al-Ta'adil from his own madhab sent him a letter rebuking him. Hmm. We're talking about this same one. Or who went to the government. Not to the panel initially, it's supposed to be the government to try to get Taqib Taymiyyah killed 
when that same scholar had said that that government were tyrants. Why would you go to tyrants to try to get a man killed? Wow. That's why he's not listed as Sika. Oh. He wrote some great books. Listen, we're not knocking that. True. That's true, Rahimullah. But we have to look at things in historical context. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, that'll get us to where we're supposed to get to. It'll get us to where we're supposed to get to. Because the same, this same individual that's being cited, where is he buried? Where are all the other opponents? Where, where's, where's the Ibn Hajar hate to me? Like, where are all these other people buried? Like we were discussing before, some time ago, the people that spent their time reviling Taqid and Taymiya, Allah has amplified him above them. <laughs> His books are all over the place. <laughs> and it's not the Ala Saud royal family. It was before them that his books wound up all over the place. It was before them that his books wound up all over the place and his name wound up being cited. In the Sharh on Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, Mullah Ali Qari cites him several times. He cited numerous times, sometimes being called Al-Mujadid and sometimes being called Sheikh Al-Islam. Mm -hmm. This is by Mullah Ali Qari, the big Hanafi Maturidi who died 10, 1014 Hijri. He's in Afghanistan. Somehow the books found him there. <laughs> well, legend travels fast, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the thing. We have to be honest. So in the course of this reviling and all these other things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has amplified his name over his own brothers. He had brothers. He had Abdullah bin Tamim. He's been amplified over that. Because I'm telling you, if you have a legitimate mujtahid, who the Rasul said, when, he's, when he makes ishtihad and he's mistaken, he has two, he, when he makes ishtihad and he's correct, he has two words, when he's mistaken, he has one. You legitimately try to revile those people, Allah will amplify them. And that's what's happened. You can go to his grave today and you can find that they're in a row. Taqiyyidin Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, and Ibn Kithir, they're in a row. Two Hanbalis and an Ashabi. Allah, Allah. <laughs> so this is my thing. I think this stuff is simple. Indeed. But people are trying to make it complex. And it starts by tampering with an entire historical heritage, mm -hmm. which in this case is Imam Josie, rahimahullah, his theological heritage. People, people aren't even ready for what we discussed regarding his hadith legacy. Oh, wow. His tafsir legacy, his zuhud legacy. I mean, that alone, it deserves its own. That alone could, those could be separate podcasts by themselves. Yes. In just a short little, the, the short smidgen that I gave. It's like those things could be separate podcasts like themselves. <laughs> but, but people deal with his theological mm -hmm. legacy because... And, the, and these same people would say that they don't blind follow anybody. Yet they keep quoting the same statements over and over again. So then which is it? Fact of the matter is, why don't you read Kitab Akhbar Sifat and Defa Shubat Tashbih? Then read it alongside Sayyid Al-Khatir. Read Al-I'tiqad Al-Qadri. <laughs> read Al-Mu'tamid and Talat Ta'wila. And see if you still think. Subhanallah. <laughs> forget, forget all the rest of the elders first. We'll forget that. I want you to read what he said about Al-I'tiqad Al-Qadidi. His ta'liqat on that. And understand where Al-I'tiqad Al-Qadidi came from. Because you went from a mukhtasar to a mukhtasar to the big book. So what... what <laughs> What do we do now? Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do. Right. This was an in-house discussion. Yes. It was in-house. That's why when you look at the introduction to that book, he doesn't address it to everybody. He's talking to us. Hanabila, inside of school. 
Mm-hmm. Just as just as much as when uh just as much as when Abdul Qahir al Baghdadi is having the debate of Firq bin uh, al Firq bin al Firq about the Ashaira, the early Ashaira debating whether Istiwa is literal regarding Julus or whether it's Istawla. I wasn't interested in that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's their internal stuff. I, I don't want to know anything about that stuff. Or the prophet sinning or not. The early Ashaira were battling about what the prophet said. Mm-hmm. I don't need to know. I don't that stuff doesn't even interest me. You start talking about Ilm al Kalam or how how um or how uh uh how Fakhruddin al Razi uh said that uh, all the ahadith that mention uh, no Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi said all the hadith that mention the attribute of isba what in English translates finger that all those ahadith are fabricated mm-hmm. or or none of them are established that have that wording and there's like oh, more than nineteen companions have narrated that hadith. Oh. We I don't I don't. You know, I don't get interested in that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? Or how Fakhruddin al Razi uh, said that certain certain ahadith can be denied because they don't make logical sense. Oh. Right? I, I I don't <laughs> I don't get interested in that stuff. Because I don't put my cranium over the revelation. And those are in-house debates within the Ashaya. I don't know who won out in the end. I have no idea. But those are, that's in-house stuff. Now, this is in-house stuff within one individual from the Medhead mm-hmm. facing down a whole bunch of other elders. SubhanAllah. Now, he said he doesn't make taqlid of anybody in the itiqat, which means he's going back into all this other stuff, which is strangely enough because of how tightly he follows al Qur'an and Salat, in this area he saw fit to just go to his own conclusion. So, Which is strange. Is this is this uh, an error in ijtihad? Of yes. The yes. Mm-hmm. This is an example because it's so strange that he saw fit right. where the Qur'an and Salat had affirmed these texts. He saw fit to say, no, we don't do it better than that. So he went into the complete literature of the first three generations and he would yeah. extract like that without referencing back to the elders in the book. That's it. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. This, this, that's it. This, oh, is, well. this is what's happened. Mm-hmm. And saying, okay, well, listen, we have to do this. We have to do that. We have to do this. We have to do that. So he went into all these other, what a, these other areas. Such a huge amount of work <laughs> to do that. Yeah, to, to go through all of those because the Akhbar al-Sifat are many in number. They're not, they're not a few. They are many. Hmm. So when, when something like this happens, you think to yourself, subhanAllah, how, how did we get here? Right. <laughs> and you can only say, well, we must have arrived here what? because, uh, <laughs> because of what happened. You see, the, the interesting is they don't do this with the fiqh of Imam al Jawzi, but they do it with his i'tiqat. If they're it's, gone. it's yeah. such a strange thing. It's it's such a strange thing. Because we, we don't we we let whatever things are happening um that they have, whatever issues that are happening, we just let them get on with it because these are internal things that have to be mm-hmm. sorted out or discussed and worked on. Right? And we understand that these these things have to be worked on because someone has uh, uh, come to a divergent opinion or understanding and has mm-hmm. come from most likely some ishtihad or something like this, right? So this is understood. These types of things, they can happen. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't negate that uh, for a second. So we have to be, we have to be honest regarding these affairs. Um, stand firm on these matters and not allow ourselves to get distracted Mm -hmm. by unnecessary uh, fighting or battling and these types of these types of things especially especially when the audience being referenced isn't you Mm -hmm. so to understand that you have to have all the literature 
because you can't you can't not be the audience targeted but then assume that you understand all the literature how you don't have everything in front of you what was the background to the discussion how did they come to that conclusion and why did they reach that conclusion right how what why did we reach that conclusion mm-hmm. just just like there's a hadith like you know you have a hadith in ahmed ahmed's musnad and tirmidhi now ahmed and his musnad everyone makes it clear imam suyuti as well as in hajj al-asqalani that there's no weak hadith in musnad Oh. But when Al-Razi saw the hadith about Jibreel stuffing the mud in the mouth of the Fir'aun to keep him from saying La ilaha illallah, he said, oh, well, that, that hadith must be fabricated because it interferes with the intellect. What are you talking about? We let them have their internal discussion. This to us is uh, baseless. We're not mm-hmm. hearing that. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're not listening to that. But it's an internal, yeah. some type of internal struggle that's happening with yourselves okay well let them let them have that and let them have that discussion they'll figure it out and they'll mm-hmm. get ironed out and do time amongst them another thing that i find interesting behind uh, the people who translated this book by memnal Josie is that it does not seem that the intention was to bring out hanbali creed to the english-speaking people but more like bring out something from a hanbali perspective which supports their creed because mm-hmm. if their intention was truly to bring out something uh, from the Hanbali creed, they would have, for example, translated uh, Al-Ain wal-Athar mm-hmm. or Lawam al-Anwar al mm-hmm. But that, that would take, you see, that would take too much time. Sure. That's what number I'm... one for them. And, and number two, Al-Ain wal-Athar only deals with about three or four Masail. Okay. And even to translate that would be an intimidating prospect because... Al-Ain wal Athar, the arguments just sound a little bit too good from the quote unquote enemies. They have too many ayat and ahadith. It's, it's too textual. Mm-hmm. This, this could get people looking at it from just a way that we don't want them to. <laughs> so we, we won't do that one. <laughs> we'll do this one instead. Yeah. Because even, even from the standpoint of, of, of the Luma, it's like for every mas'ala, there's a proof. Like when you look in the Luma, for every single mas'ala, mm-hmm. there's a proof. Yes. There's some text, there's some general statement that's been made. Some ayah, some hadith. Like the first page has like four ayat already. You're only on the first page, it's like four ayat. Mm-hmm. Then you've got Aqwal from the first three generations, Ahmed, Shafi. Then you've got a quote on the third page, starting from Abdullah Mas'ud, and then you've got Omar Abdul Aziz, then you've got Al, uh, Abu Amr al Awza'i, Muhammad, Muhammad al Adrami, then you've got Ashab near the end, like Ibn Omar and others. It's like, what do you do with that? Mm-hmm. There's nothing you can do with it. Mm-hmm. You just submit. That's why it's the the illumination. Yes. That's what it's there for, is to illuminate stuff. A question. The kitab by, not the kitab, actually, but more metan by Imam Safarini, al Duratul Maldiyah. This is a manzuma, right? Yes. Uh, this brief. is, and what, what, what this is, is Imam Safarini, rahimahullah, took the Luma'a, al mm-hmm. Al Athar, the Nihaya, and the Balvani. He boiled them all down and created that 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 manduma. Subhanallah. Then he made a sharh on that. So that is the largest sharh that there is on those four kutub together. Mm-hmm. There is no bigger. After that, it's like you're done. You've you've squeezed the the luma dry. Oh. Like after you do you do the luma, you memorize the luma, then you do uh, the nihaya, the balbani. Najat al-Khalif, then you do that, I mean, you squeeze it dry. Mm-hmm. And then once you understand that, it's like the Luma is like a blueprint. It's just like it's imprinted on your heart. Yes. You, you can't go anywhere now. People bring up stuff all the time. And I just think of like the Luma, like a section from the Luma. 
then what you do is usually a teacher, someone will tell you that you, you make sure to review it every month. So every, you should be finishing it like every 19 days mm. at, at the most that that's like, if you do a page a day, but if you do five pages every day, you finish every four to four or five days, mm-hmm. keep it reviewed, keep it fresh. That's, that's the thing. So it's like, which is another thing people forget. Like you remember Jose, Allah, his love of like hip and fasting and very oh. bad which is something that's ignored. You chose to translate one contentious thing by, which isn't even representative of his entire theological. That's that's not representative of his entire theological heritage. That's one thing. Why wouldn't you translate say the Khatir? Translate that. Or Akbar Ahl Rasul. Which is which is his thing on the introduction to hadith and other things. Why not translate that? Mm-hmm. But you chose that one thing, which is not even the complete discussion. It's an extra. Because if you look at how he ended that book, that's not the complete discussion. Because mm-hmm. again, these scholars, they write books in a series. It ends abruptly. But Akhbar al-Sifat does not. It has a full, you see, you have what's called an iftitah, the opening of a book. And then you have a khitam, which is, or a khatam, it's ending. And there's a way you begin and end books. You end a book abruptly, it's because the thought's not finished, but that for that moment, that's done. And that's how the Fashib al is ended. Mm-hmm. Not a khitam on that. It's not, mm-hmm. it's, it's not like that. But again, it's understanding how to read books. Right. So you've, you've got Defa Shiba Tashbir. Have you read Kitab Akhbar Sifa? Well, no. Have you read Sayyid al Khatim? No. Why? Mm-hmm. When these books were written within close proximity to another, and these books are meant to be read a certain way. That's, that's like the order that Mu'afrid al Qadam has written, like Al Umda, Al Muqni, uh, Al Kafi, mm-hmm. right? And the Muqni. But someone's like, actually, I'm going to start by reading the Mughani first. Why would you do that? That curriculum was specifically written to assist you. Mm-hmm. And you're starting at the end of the line. Or the kutub that were written after, it's like, okay, listen, you've got, you know, Zad al and then you build up from there to this. No, I'm going to start by reading Al-Muntaha. Wait a minute. That, you, you're stepping up much too quickly. Imam Mansur Bahuti, rahimahullah, he created a curriculum. He created Umda to Talib, which is a Sharhan, mm-hmm. that's the smallest one, and the step up, Rodum Murbi, and Kashaf Qina. Then he's got a Hashia on the Muntaha. And then there's his final, his final Qawl is a Muntaha. That was like, that's his final state. Mm-hmm. His final statement ever on fiqh is. Umdat al Talib, which he does like six months before he died. Oh. But his final lengthy statement, like big shah, that's the Muntaha. Mm-hmm. So there's a conflict between Kashaf and Muntaha. But it's like, but these, this is because you're writing things in a series. Ibn al Jazi is no different, Rahimullah. He's no different. Remember how we discussed the order that he wrote those hadith books in? Mm-hmm. That's the order you study those in. The order of his tafsir, that's the order you study that in. Why? To get the best out of it. Mm-hmm. Yes. And his creed to get the best out of it. You really want to understand his noadir, like his, his oddities and creed, then, then study it, really study it. But look at him in his, con- like his full context so you can appreciate it for what it is. But they're not appreciating for what it is. So in- instead, it creates this jaded view of the Imam Rahimullah, mm-hmm. yes. who really was a trailblazer in so many different fields because of his the depth of his knowledge. We're talking about a man who wrote more books than any other man in history that we know of. With his own hand, 2000. Stop. Now, Imam Masyuti Rahimullah, 748. That's pretty good. But it's still not 2000. We don't know of anyone who his, in history, and it's not just within the ulum sharia, like he, he got into like other stuff. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's why I quoted the historical stuff. Mm-hmm. That's history. He's not even talking about. He's getting into historical stuff, talking about astronomy and the yeah. the na- the nature of heavenly bodies that are moving through the world and the eclipse. Like he proves through eclipses how the sun is bigger than the earth, the proximity of where the sun is, and what, how about how big the moon is, and things like that. That's utterly remarkable. That that's that's through astronomy. But then again, this man had an observatory in, in the back of his house. So obviously he's looking at this stuff. I mean, by Imam Al-Jawzi's time, Rahimullah, you have to understand Imam al karji another big Hanbali elder, Rahimullah, had figured out a way to make uh, flush toilets using gravity. Mm-hmm. So using the propulsion of water and gravity, he created flush toilets. Oh. Now, at first, the Baghdadis were, the people in Baghdad were averse because they weren't, they weren't sure about you know, with regarding hy- hydrology and water, how dangerous that might be for Baghdad. So he introduced it in Iran first. Wow. And Rai, and, those, and it worked. And after that, a few years later, he came to Baghdad and introduced it there. Oh. And then it became a norm. And so now you had Baghdad also using steam in the summer to keep Baghdad cool. And then in the winter, keeping it warm using heated water. So Baghdad was probably one of the first cities that never slept. New York didn't even exist yet. (laughs) Baghdad never slept. And you had fountains. And you had flush toilets using gravity. This is the reality. So in the era of Imam Nujozi, you've got 70 hospitals in Baghdad. You have flush toilets using gravity, water and gravity. You have observatories in many people's homes. This is the state of Baghdad when Imam Al-Jawzi Rahimahullah is there. He belongs to that time period. So he deserves, no, he has the right that we present him in the best way because he belongs to he, he he's he's bigger than just belonging to the hanbalis mm-hmm. he's a part of our great muslim heritage yes so he should be presented as part of our just as people talk about world heritage sites he's a heritage and his written legacy should be presented as such because of what he represents He's immense. And that's the respect that is owed to him. Mm-hmm. But when that becomes uh, twisted or it becomes transmogrified or distorted from its original form, then we really lose out. Even if we think we're doing a good thing, we really lose out because we don't get to appreciate Imam Joseph Allah regarding his relation to Abdul Ghani Abdul Wahid the Maqdisi and how he kind of pushed into motion a lot of the things that helped in the field of hadith. Him and Mu'af al-Din al-Qudama, rahimahullah, one of the asanid of Imam Mu'af al-Din al-Qudama in hadith is through Ibn Jawzi. Mm-hmm. He's one of his teachers in hadith. And in Al-Mughni or other ahadith, he'll sometimes refer to him, he'll cite him. He'll quote him as as his isnad. Well, yes, through, through my sheikh, uh, Abu Faraj Abdul Rahman, he has said. And when he cites a hadith, most times when he says sheikhana, he means Ibn Jawzi. Mm-hmm. That's huge. And then you have those asani coming down to us through other ways as well. And the citation that Imam al Dhahabi gives Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, Ibn Jawzi is referred to as thiqa trustworthy and he gives him several pages 10 pages longer than the other imam that was reviling 10 pages more than him then you have to remember that he's a direct descendant of Bakr Siddiq then you have Mu'afuddin Qudama, Abu Umar al-Maqdisi Abdul Ghanin Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi they're all direct descendants of Omar then you have Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jinani, who's 
their sheikh who's the direct descendant on both sides, Hassan and Al Hussein to Rasul Aisatusam, Fatima and Ali. So you have Ahl al Bayt and the foremost Mashallah. Sahaba, the first four of those promised paradise in the same room. <laughs> How do you do that? Mashallah. That's the thing. It deserves to be respected and to, to present him as part of our great heritage and our great history. He's a massive part of history. But you can't appreciate him unless you appreciate him on his terms. Mm-hmm. 